<laughs> Philip Gardner came to watercolour painting by way of advertising. It might seem a surprising route, but from the world of tough commercialism has developed a delicate and flowing style well suited to the North Norfolk coast, which provides most of his inspiration. I think this is my favourite picture. Uh, that's Cromer from West London. Uh, and I like it because it's so restrained, there's so much left out, but it leaves something to the imagination and I think it evokes a, a mood and a feeling and to me that's what that part of God is about. Was that, did you do that during the winter? It's a style that has brought him a loyal and growing following in recent years. For a one-man show like this one at the Ringstead Gallery near Hunston, collectors now come from all over East Anglia and beyond and many of them come to buy. You rather like the one of Hulk over there, John? One over there. That's Hulk and Beach, uh, that's £125. Oh, she's going to set me back a bit, isn't it? OK, then, Dolph. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It's all right. OK. Besides shows in Norfolk, Gardner's paintings have also been seen at galleries in London and at exhibitions in Holland, Norway, and even, unexpectedly, Mexico City. The Bank of Mexico, for instance, has so far bought nine of his Norfolk seascapes. Nearer home, the Queen has a gardener painting of Holcomb Beach, given to her by a former lady-in-waiting as a gift for her silver jubilee. At 60, Gardner has now been earning his living as a painter for the past five years. And since his home is near Blakeney, it's to this popular holiday centre that he often comes for his subjects. But not for him, the familiar picture postcard tourist views. Instead, he leaves the village behind and makes his way out towards Blakeney Point, to where the land meets sea and sky. never paints on location, but it's here that he does his preparatory work, sketching and making notes. It's in his studio that the contents of his sketchbooks are transformed into his very own personal impression of the Norfolk coast. His success in capturing the rare quality of the light there is largely due to the economy of his style. He says he likes music in a minor key and that the north coast of Norfolk, with its marshes and creeks, is in a minor key. And that's the way he paints it. Most of his work is done here, in the studio he built at the end of the garden of his home at Wiverton.
Remembering happy holidays in Norfolk as a child, he first bought the house in the mid-sixties as a weekend escape from the pressures of London. Finding it more and more of a wrench to go back, he eventually made this his permanent home, and for seven years he ran his advertising business from here. Hello, Hello. In 1977, he made the final break. Turning his back on the commercial world of London, he took to painting full-time. Nowadays, Gardner rarely leaves North Norfolk. Since his second marriage, his home and his family life have become especially important to him. He works eight hours a day, six days a week. It's a busy but very private life with his wife, nicknamed Partridge, and their young daughter, Hilary. He is, he says, in love with his adopted county, its bracing climate, its people, and above all, with that very special light that has inspired so many painters before him. You had a nice afternoon, darling? Yes, thank you. I went down to Pyre Beach and had a paddle. Paddle? Yes. Wasn't it cold? Oh, was it rough? Well, quite rough. Philip Gardner, having tempted you out of your home and your studio into this studio, can I take you right back to the very beginning of your life and ask whether you always knew that whatever happened to you, in the end, you would finish up as a painter? Well, I, no, I don't think I, I, I don't think I ever thought that I would. I, certainly, there was a stage when I wanted to be, but. Uh, I was brought up in the 20s and people didn't become artists in those. It was regarded as a very precarious and unlikely thing to do. My father didn't uh, think that was a good idea at all and I wasn't encouraged at school on the whole um, to be a, not a painter, but because uh, I always wanted to earn my living by doing something creative. I mean, that was inside me, but I didn't really see the means of doing it at that stage. And in the family, there was no history of art at all? Not really, no. My father was the design manager of, uh, of the Viola Company, so to that extent he obviously had a sense of design and, uh, and a feeling for colour. But I don't know, as far as I know, there are no artistic gardeners around other than me. And was there at school any one teacher who traditionally encouraged you to be a painter? There was a master at prep school, I remember, that drew very well indeed, and he influenced me and, and did encourage me, yes. But uh, other than that, not much. So then when you left school, was it to be a painter, to try to be a painter? No, well, I, I left school, you see, uh, straight into the war. And so uh, I, there wasn't much time to think about being anything except doing something in the war. And uh, so I went into the fleet air arm and uh, I was there for f five years. And were you able even there to carry on at occasional moments with the painting? Well, uh, I wasn't painting, you see, but I, I was always drawing. I used to draw caricatures of people and... Uh, illustrate things for people. Anybody who wanted anything illustrated used to come to me and I used to draw it. Probably did it rather badly, but uh, it's like the chap who can play the piano. He's usually rather popular and uh, <laughs> if you can draw, people find things for you to draw for them. So I was always drawing, uh, and but uh, not seriously. So then when you came back from the war, was it to try and find some sort of job as an artist? Well, no, I'd had the five years of the war to think about it, and I realised I did want to do something creative, and it seemed to me that advertising offered the best opportunities for somebody with my untrained talent. I mean, where the ability to draw would be useful, but not imperative. And I managed to talk myself into an advertising agency, and it, it took off from there. But it, they didn't see me as an artist, they saw me as a writer, and I became much more of a writer, though I did become a writer who could draw, which was slightly odd. But working on what sort of campaigns? Well, I worked on a breakfast sale on Weetabix uh, for a long time. Um, and I, because of my flying background, uh, I, I handled a flying account. Um, some people at Oxford who both teach flying and sell aeroplanes, and that went on for a long time. Those sort of things. And uh, after I turned freelance, I was actually commissioned by the Times to redesign the whole of the Times. It was at the time that they put news on the front page. They'd made that decision, but they, they said, will you redesign the rest of the paper? Uh, and I had a partner in those days, and we, we did redesign the, the Times. And we got to the point where Sir William Haley actually wrote me a letter of congratulation and said, you know, I think you now have an idea that will germinate. It was a rather difficult man. And uh, a week later, he said goodbye, and we never heard another word from him. But of course, it was then that Lord Thompson bought 
the times, and so the ideas but didn't immediately come to pass, though a lot of them have appeared. But all through those changing times, were you really working with a view to making time for yourself to paint? Were the jobs just something that had to be done to make the money? No, I don't think I was. I was enjoying the advertising work. Uh, and if I thought of myself as anything, it was I thought, when I turn legitimate, I'll write books rather than paint, because I'd rather left painting behind. Uh, the drawing was something I did, it was a great convenience to be able to put ideas on the back of an envelope which were articulate, which people could follow. It might be an idea for a photograph, but uh, the, the idea, to, the, the ability to, to express something in a visual form as well as writing the words and do it all at the same time. It was a great help. I wrote a lot of television commercials and the ability to see things in pictures and words at the same time was, was marvellous. That, that did help me, undoubtedly. But from that very active London life in advertising, in journalism, after all, to do with the times, what caused this extraordinary change, both of geography in terms of coming to Norfolk and of career in terms of becoming a painter? Well, I already had a house, uh, up, uh, a cottage really, on the Norfolk coast, which we used for weekends. And uh, the weekends got longer because as I worked for myself and worked at home, I used to take Monday up here and... Uh, and go back to London on Tuesday. But the transition <coughs> I beg your pardon, became uh, untenable. I didn't want to go back. And uh, so I said one day to Partridge, my wife, uh, I don't want to go back, you know. I, I can't bear going back to London. And she, being a lot younger than me, said, why do we? So we didn't. And uh, in a rather cavalier fashion, we stayed up here and told our clients, well, if you want to see us, we're in Norfolk, but we're not coming to London. But could you carry on in advertising in that way? Yes, I carried on an advertising consultancy for seven years that way. And, and clients did come. Of course, they came and stayed with us. They liked it as much as we did in the <laughs> end. What had made you choose this part of Norfolk? Well, I, I was born in Bedford, which is a rather relaxing place. And uh, Norfolk was thought to be bracing, a good place for children to be taken for holiday. So I'd, from, a, from childhood on, I'd been coming to Norfolk, and I'd always had a sort of especially soft spot for it. It's got something about it. I don't know. I can't really put my finger on it, but there's just something about the place and the people that has always drawn me. I mean, I, I feel as I was born in Norfolk, though I wasn't. And were you aware in the consultancy years that you were spending more and more time painting and less and less time advertising? No, that happened really quite suddenly because a friend of mine had seen the drawings that I was doing for, for the advertising work. And he said, you must have an exhibition, uh, you know, an academic exhibition. And I'd never thought in there. I'd never thought in terms of putting anything in a frame. But uh, I allowed myself to be talked into this. And uh, I allowed myself to be talked into it, sharing it with somebody else. And, and so I couldn't let them down because uh, they had to play. It was a woman. She had to supply 50 pictures, and I did. Uh, and there were about three months, I think, in which to produce 50 pictures. So I had to sit down and paint 50 pictures and put them in frames and, and exhibit them. And was there a single painting at that exhibition which made your name? Well, I suppose there was, really. It was 1977, which was the year of the Queen's Silver Jubilee, and uh, the, the gallery where the exhibition was being held was part of the Holcomb Estate, which is where Lady Leicester lived, and Lady Leicester had been a lady-in-waiting to the Queen. And the Queen has a private piece of beach at Holcomb, and uh, I thought that being Jubilee uh, it would be a nice gesture to have a, a Jubilee picture. I must say, I saw it slightly as a Jubilee joke. Uh, so I painted a picture of Holcomb Beach, which is really miles of nothing. And in the extreme distance, about that height, a, a figure in blue with two small brown dots, which in fact were corgis, <laughs> and called it H.M. Queen Elizabeth. And the picture was bought by Lady Leicester, and... Uh, presented to the Queen as a, uh, as a jubilee present, and the Queen wrote back a charming letter saying how delighted she was with it, and uh, what a remarkable coincidence about the figure and the distance of the two <laughs> small brown dots. But the, of course the press got hold of the story, and uh, people started knocking on my door after that. And from that right royal beginning, you did become an artist, and of course an artist, a full-time artist, whose work perhaps most of us think of first in connection with the Norfolk seascapes. I'd like us to talk about those, but first of all, Let's look at some of them.
those paintings in that sequence. But I wonder, they are in a way very different from seascapes that I had certainly expected or grown up with. They are distinguished, but they're also in a way minimal. They're very unlike the obvious picture postcard Norfolk seascapes. They're not boats bobbing on brisk seas. They are suggestive, impressionistic. Is that always the way you've worked? Has that always been your style? Well, you've said all the right things. I mean, that's what I want, that's, that's what I want them to be. Um, it is my style, and, and maybe that derives to some extent from my advertising background, because I think if, if you learn one thing in advertising, it is to distill things. And uh, I do, I try to paint what I feel rather than what I see. Um, that, that may be an arrogant thing to say, but I think there is a difference. I, I, I'm not a topographical painter. I don't sit on the spot and paint uh, what is before me. I, I commit it to my mind, and then I use what I've seen, and uh, forget a lot of it, and then arrange it on the paper in such a way that it will create the mood, at least as, as I saw it. But now, was it the choice of Norfolk as a place to live that conditioned the interest in that kind of seascape? Well, I love the sea anyway. Uh, um, and of course, the, the light in Norfolk is very special, and, and it always has attracted painters. I mean, the Norwich School of Painting was probably the finest school of watercolour painting in this country, and, and it, it does, it is inspirational. I mean, even on a dull day, you sort of have to squint slightly, and uh, things are in very sharp relief. And you, of course, chose watercolour as opposed to oil. Why was that? Well, I like watercolours. If I were buying a painting, it would be a watercolour almost invariably. Uh, and also, I'm an impatient individual, and uh, with oil, you can, you can go on fiddling. You can, I mean, people go on painting on oil for a year, two years sometimes. Uh, I want to paint it and be on to the next one. And uh, with watercolour, that's what you've got to do. I mean, you've got to throw the water on and be very bold, and uh, it is said to be largely a controlled accident. And, uh, it is like wa walking a tightrope. I mean, Seago said that uh, he could relax when he was painting in oil, but he said, when I'm painting in watercolour, I'm as taut as, I think I put it, taut as, as a bowstring, I think was the expression. And I know the feeling. Do you feel the shadow of Seago hanging over your life or not, your work? Not anymore. When I first started to paint, I was undoubtedly, as many people have been, very influenced. I mean, I think he's a marvellous painter. And I think he felt about Norfolk as I feel about Norfolk, at least that's what I read into, into looking at his paintings. Uh, and I'm sure he influenced my style at the beginning, but I, I, like anything else, you develop your own handwriting. Uh, and I haven't deliberately tried to get away from Seagull's style anymore, and I deliberately copied it. I was lucky enough to do a book that he designed the cover oh. for. Did you get to know him? Did you know him as a man? No, I didn't. No, he died just before I came to Norfolk, I think. He was an extraordinary figure, and, and there is certainly a link to your work. I, I do see that very strongly. Well, we're painting the same things for a start. <laughs> but did you feel you had to get away from the people who come to Norfolk in order to get those, in a way, very barren, almost empty seascapes? Did you have to choose beaches where there weren't going to be tourists, for instance? Well, n not particularly painting the way I do, because if there are tourists, I simply don't put them in. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, the, the, the part of Norfolk um, where I live, uh, particularly in the winter, it is very barren. And, and in fact, uh, people won't get out of their cars. You've only got to walk for 10 minutes at, at Blakeney, for instance, and you won't see another soul. Do you find that you are influenced by the seasons? Are you a, a winter painter or a summer painter in that sense? Uh, no, I paint all the seasons. But, uh, but the one thing that I do is to, uh, I always try to paint the sky of the day. Um, I look out of the, uh, my studio and I, I paint that sky. And so the picture is, if it's a dull day, it, it's a... a well, I hope it's not a gloomy picture, but it's, that's the sort of sky I paint. But now, it would be quite wrong to talk about you only as a painter of seascapes. You are, of course, also a painter of marvellous, almost caricatured faces and figures and people. Let's again look at those before we talk about them. Thank you. 
Now there, there does seem to be a lot of jokiness and humour and almost journalistic observation of strange types. Does that relate back more towards your earlier life, your London advertising life, than the perhaps lonelier Norfolk seascape life? I don't think it does, really. I, I, I've always caricatured things. I've always caricatured people. In fact, I can't draw a person without caricaturing them. Uh, but I think it, it, it runs through the seascapes as well. I think if you look at my figures on a beach, they are slightly caricatured. You can caricature a tree. It's, it's getting the, the essence of something and putting it in the right place just so that it, it immediately means something to somebody. And, I mean, that's what caricaturing the person's about, isn't it? it um, I think caricatures are often more like people than straight portraits. I don't think people should do straight portraits because they don't know the person. But now where do you find those marvellous faces, those types? Well, they're all around us, aren't they? <laughs> you know, I collect people, rather like writers collect people. Uh, you go into a pub or sit on a bus or wherever it might be, you see these marvellous faces and uh, I seem to be able to commit them to memory. But is there a danger that as we get to be a more plastic, homogenised culture, those kind of faces are actually disappearing off the face of the pubs and the world? Well, I think they are, just as voices are becoming smoothed out uh, due to television as much as anything else. But uh, I think we all think that, uh, that the world is changing and the people are no longer characters. I tend to think that my father's generation was the last generation of characters. I mean, you probably think the same thing about your father. Yes, indeed. But uh, perhaps our children will think that you know, they'll say, oh, my old dad, he was the, you know, they were real characters in those days. I suppose it's always been the same. Perhaps it always will be. Now, I suppose the third major area of your work as an artist is the sporting work, mm -hmm. the paintings of various sports. And that's something which seems to come to you rather than you going out to find it. Well, I'm a sport addict, and I'm also a television addict, and you do get such marvellous pictures of sport uh, on television that really most of it comes off there, because uh, I draw um, athletic meetings, for instance, and I've never been to an athletic meeting in my life. In fact, I didn't find it attractive until television came along, and suddenly it, it, it is attractive, and there's so much movement and colour and life that... Uh, Yes, it mostly comes off television. Well, let's look at some of the pictures that you've drawn off the television pictures. Now there you are seeing the sports through the eye of a television cameraman. Does that make a difference? Yes, I think it probably does, but then I very much admire television camera work. I think you, you see marvellous pictures on television, whether it's sport or whatever it might be. I do tend to draw through the lens of a camera, I think. And of course now you're totally established as an artist. Your work is selling as far afield as Mexico. What do you think explains the fascination there for it? Well, of course, that was a fluke. I mean, Partridge's sister, my sister-in-law, lives in Mexico City, and she came over for a holiday, and uh, 
she saw my pictures and said, oh, I could sell them in Mexico. And I said, well, don't be silly. You know, the color's all wrong. The murky old Norfolk and uh, all the bright razzmatazz in, in Mexico. And she said, no, I can. And she took oh, I don't know, a dozen pictures back, I think, and promptly sold them. And in no time set up an exhibition at one of the better galleries in Mexico City and sold all of them as well. In fact, I had two exhibitions there. Now, one thinks perhaps wrongly of your life now as infinitely more relaxed, more enviable than the pressure of the tense life of a London advertising man. But in fact, is the life of an artist as easy, as quiet, as laid back as that? Well, it is on one side. I mean, the, it, it's an absolutely marvellous existence. It's idyllic. I wouldn't have it any other way. But the actual business of painting uh, does require attention. It is a, a tense-making business, it, particularly in watercolour. It's walking a tightrope. It can go wrong at any minute if you take your eye off it. And it'll defeat you, and you mustn't allow that to happen. So at the end of the day, you can feel pretty drained. It is, it is very tense, but I think it has to be. That's the fun of it. I mean, it, it, that's what makes it good. But as finally you look to the future, is it with trepidation towards the next exhibition, the next painting that has to be sold, or is it with a kind of confidence that you are now fully established in this second career as an artist? Well, I, I don't think any artistic or creative person really ever feels secure. I don't think they want, I don't want to feel secure because it's the very precariousness of it that gives it this, um, well, it's a certain, it adds a certain luster to life, I think. Um, my paintings perhaps um, are more confident, and one becomes more confident of, of, of them uh, as a means of expression. But um, I just look forward to going on painting and getting better. I mean, I don't like what I paint. At the end of the day, I may like it, but the next day I don't. And uh, I don't want to like it, because once I, once I do like my own paintings, then uh, I shall have stopped progressing, and that's the time to give up. Well, luckily, there are many of us who do like your paintings and hope that you won't give up. Philip Gardner, thank you for talking to us. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.